Story Dramas, brought to you by Nelson Almstead. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to another story drama presented by NBC's outstanding narrator, Nelson Almstead. The narrative tonight is included in Nelson Almstead's list of the ten best short stories ever written, representing one of the finest tales of the supernatural ever to appear in the English language. Here is Charles Dickens, The Signal Man, and Nelson Almstead. Hello below there! When the signal man heard my voice calling to him, he was standing at the door of his little hut with a flag in his hand furled around its short pole. One would have thought, considering the nature of the ground, that he could not have doubted from what quarter the voice came. But instead of looking up to where I stood at the top of the steep man-made cutting nearly over his head, he turned himself about and looked down the railway line. Hello below there! From looking down the line, he turned himself about again, and raising his eyes, he saw my figure above him. Is there any path by which I can come down and talk to you? He looked up at me without replying, and I looked down at him without pressing him too soon with the repetition of my idle question. Just then there came a vague vibration of the earth and air as a train passed over the line beside him at the bottom of the cutting and roared into the tunnel at the far end. Then the signal man pointed to a round, zigzag descending path, and I started the side of the cutting, down which I made my way. The cutting was extremely deep and unusually precipitate. It was made through a clammy stone that became oozier and wetter as I went down. But when I came down low enough upon the zigzag descent to see him again, he was standing between the rails on the way by which the train had lately passed. He was a dark, sallow man with dark beard and rather heavy eyebrows. His post was in as solitary and dismal a place as ever I saw. On either side, a dripping wet wall of jagged stone, excluding all view but a strip of the sky, one end terminating in a gloomy red light and the gloomier entrance of a black tunnel in whose massive architecture there was a, a barbarous, depressing and forbidding air. So little sunlight ever found its way to the spot that it had an earthy, deadly smell and so much cold wind rushed through it that it struck chill to me. He just looked at me, didn't talk. So I said nothing about, so I said something about the lonesome post he had to occupy and that it had riveted my attention when I looked down from up yonder. He directed a most curious look around the red light near the tunnel's mouth and looked all about it as if something were missing from it. I said, uh, that light is part of your charge, isn't it? Don't you know it is? He answered in a low voice. Well, you, you, you look at me as if you had a dread of me. I was doubtful whether I'd seen you before. Oh, where? He pointed to the red light he looked at. There, I asked? Yes. <laughs> oh, my good fellow, what should I be doing there? However, be that as it may, I never was there, believe me. I think I believe you. Yes, I'm sure I do. His manner cleared like my own. And I questioned him about his duties in that lonely spot and about those many long and lonely hours spent there. He was friendly enough and took me into his little hut where there was a fire, a desk, a telegraphic instrument, and a little signal bell. We talked easily, and from the conversation, I found that he had once been in college, but had run wild for a while, misused his opportunities, had gone down, and had never risen again. He had no complaint to offer about that. He'd made his bed, and he lay upon it. Several times, we were interrupted by the little bell, and he had to read off messages in the telegraph and send replies. In the discharge of his duties, I observed him to be remarkably exact and vigilant. As I rose to leave him, I said... Well, you almost make me think that at last I met with a contented man. Hmm. I believe I used to be so. But I'm troubled. I'm troubled. Oh, what do you mean? 
It's very difficult to tell, sir. It's very, very difficult to speak of. Let me ask you, what made you cry, hello below there tonight? Oh, heavens knows, I cried something to that effect. Not to that effect, sir. Those were the very words. I know them well. Well, if they were, I, I said them no doubt because I saw you below. For no other reason? What other reason could I possibly have? You had no feeling that they were conveyed to you in any supernatural way? No. Oh. I took you for some, someone else this evening. That troubles me. Oh. Who, who is this person? I don't know. Is he like me? I don't know. I never saw the face. The left arm is always across the face, and the right arm is waved, violently waved. This way. I followed his action with my eyes, and it was the motion of an arm gesticulating with the utmost vehemence. An action, if interpreted into words, would probably say, For God's sakes, clear the way. One moonlit night, I was sitting here when I heard a voice cry, Hello, below there! I jumped up and looked from the door and saw this someone else standing by a red, red light near the tunnel, waving as I just now showed you. The voice seemed hoarse with shouting, and it cried, Look out! Look out! And then again, Hello, below there! Look out! I caught up my lamp and turned it on red and ran toward the figure, calling, What's wrong? What's happened? Where? It stood just outside the blackness of the tunnel. I advanced so close upon it that I wondered at its keeping the sleeve across its eyes. I ran right up to it and held out my hand, stretched out to pull the sleeve away. When it was gone. What? Gone? G gone where? Into the tunnel? No. I ran on into the tunnel, 500 yards, but saw nothing. Then I ran back here. I telegraphed both ways. An alarm has been given. Is anything wrong? The answer came back both ways. All well. Within six hours after that appearance, the memorable accident on this line happened. And within ten hours, the dead and wounded were brought along through the tunnel over the spot where the figure stood. A disagreeable shudder crept over me, but I did my best against it. It was not to be denied, I rejoined, that this was a remarkable coincidence, calculated deeply to impress his mind. But it was unquestionable that remarkable coincidences did continually occur everywhere. He had referred to say that he wasn't yet finished. This was just a year ago. Six or seven months passed, and I'd recovered from the surprise and shock when one morning, as day was breaking, I, standing at the door, looked toward the red light and saw the specter again. Did it cry out? No. It was silent. Did it wave its arm? No. It leaned against a shaft of light with both hands before the face. Like this. Well, once more I followed his action with my eyes. It was an action of mourning. I, I'd seen such an attitude in stone figures on tombs. He continued. That very day as a train came out of the tunnel... I noticed at the carriage window on my side what looked like a confusion of hands and heads, and something waved. I saw it just in time to signal the engineer to stop. He shut off and put his brakes on, but the train drifted past here 150 yards or more. I ran after it, and as I went along, heard terrible screams and cries. A beautiful young lady had died instantaneously in one of the compartments and was brought in here and laid down on this floor. Now, sir, mark this. And judge how my mind is troubled. The specter came back a week ago. Ever since it has been there, now and again by fits and starts. What? Well, at the light? Yes, at the danger light. It calls to me for many minutes together in an agonized manner. Below there, look out. For God's sakes, clear the way. By this time, you will fully understand, sir, that what troubles me so dreadfully is the question, what does the specter mean? No, I'm, I'm, I'm afraid I don't understand. What is the warning against? 
What is the danger? Where is the danger? There's danger overhanging somewhere in the line. Some dreadful calamity will happen. It's not to be doubted this third time after what's gone before. But surely this is a cruel haunting of me. What can I do? He pulled out his handkerchief and wiped the drops from his heated forehead. His pain of mind was most pitiable to see. It was a mental torture of a conscientious man, oppressed beyond endurance by an unintelligible responsibility involving life. I offered to stay through the night with him, but he wouldn't hear of it. So I took leave of him while an uncomfortable cold finger seemed to make traces up and down my spine. Well, the next evening was lovely. I walked out early to enjoy it, heading for the deep cutting. Upon arriving, I stepped to the brink and mechanically looked down. There was a group of men standing by the danger light, which was not yet lighted. With an irresistible sense that something was wrong, I descended the notched path with all the speed I could make. Uh, what, what's the matter? I asked one of the men. As a signal man killed this morning, sir. What? Not the man belonging to this place? Yes, sir. You'll recognize him, sir, if you know him. So saying, one of the men solemnly uncovered the face of my strange friend. I was horrified. How, how did this happen, I asked. He was cut down by an engine, sir. No man in England knew his work better. But somehow he wasn't clear of the outer rail. It was just at broad day. He'd struck the light and had the lamp in his hand. And as the engine came out of the tunnel, his back was toward her. And she cut him down. That man drove her and he was showing us how it happened. Show the gentleman, Tom. Tom, who wore a rough, dark suit, stepped to the mouth of the tunnel. Well, uh, coming around the curve in the tunnel, sir... I saw him at the end. There was no time to check speed, and I knew him to be very careful. As he didn't seem to take heed of the whistle, I shut it off when we were running down upon him and called to him as loud as I could call. Oh, well, what did you say? I asked. I said, below there, look out, look out. For God's sakes, clear the way. I was astounded. Oh, it... Uh, it was a terrible time, sir. I never left off calling to him. I put this arm before my eyes not to see, and I waved this arm to the last. But it was no use. This has been another of the world's greatest stories presented by Nelson Olmsted, who now has some closing comments. Well, Charles Dickens, a 19th century English author, was an astounding man. With practically no formal education, he took his experiences in life and set them on paper with such spontaneous humor and abandon that he became, in his day, one of the most popular characters in England. He's best known for his Pickwick papers, David Copperfield and The Tale of Two Cities. He wrote quite a few short stories, and yet his signal man, which we presented tonight is probably one of his least known works. Why, I don't know. Because the signal man to me represents one of the most polished examples of the perfectly formulated supernatural fiction. It's a story which builds its mood from the first line and carries a plot through to a breathtaking and imaginative climax. I only wish that Dickens had written more like it. Our next story, Wednesday night, is by the Russian Leonid Andreev, entitled Silence. Until tomorrow night, then, good night and good reading. NBC presents Nelson Almstead and his story dramas three nights each week over most of these same stations. This program has come to you from our Chicago studios, and this is the Red Network of the National Broadcasting Company. <laughs>